So our guest at the show is Norman Grant. Norman, we've seen each other so often at the shows in Poland, but we never really talked for the interview. So I'm really <laughs> glad to have you on the show. And my first question obviously is, how do you feel when you come to Poland on over time? It seems like to be your uh, an over homeland. Well, Brother Mackin, as you know, you know, Twinkle Brothers has been coming to Poland since 1988. You know, and every time we come, it's a good feeling, different feeling, but great vibes. You know, and um, I think the last time I was here, maybe a couple of years ago, with the Tribune of Turkey, I was here last year. You know, because we come here very regularly, you know. And it's a pleasure, really, to go to another country where people accept your music or listening to your music for all this time. Because from in the 70s, you know, as far as I heard, you know, the Polish people been listening to our music, you know. Wodek, you know, Wodek Klesz, he's the, the man that... Greetings for Wodek. <laughs> yeah, that make all this happen, you know. He's the one that started it. You know, he came to London in uh, 1986 and he invited me over and I did come and still coming, <laughs> you know. So that is great, you know, it's mm -hmm. a good experience, really. We we'll go back to your Polish adventures, but now I want to go to very early beginning. You are born in Jamaica. I've read you started actually your music career with your brother when you were only six. Can yes, you tell yes. me about these mm -hmm. beginnings? Yeah, well, you know, we grew up, you know, around listening, you know, the churches and things. You know, we have the Pocomenia church every day, you know, music. And in the neighborhood, on the corner, lots of music happening. So ourselves, remember, you know, we had a guy who used to organize the, the young kids, you know, for um, concerts and things. And you learn to get, put your lines together. And, you know, I remember even writing your own music from, you know, around that time. Mm -hmm. My brother and myself, we started out um, playing cans and pans, you know. I used to not get different size cans and pans, you know, when they throw in the rubbish, we look for them and hear the different sounds. The story says you made your first guitar out of some fish can. Well, Ralston, you know, he was, he, he was swooning around the guitar, you know, and um, we get we have the fishing line, we used to fishing, we get some broken line. And we made, you know, I made one myself, you know, but I was more into the drum. You know, so I created a little drum kit out of pans and thing. Ralston, I get uh, the the thing, and the sardine, the sardine tin. We use that as the the flat part to kill all the sound, you know, and put the string on, and you get a sound, you know. <laughs> so that's where it started, you know, and not just only, you know, Twinkle Brothers started that way. A lot of Jamaican bands. That's where they started, you know, making their own equipment. Because, you know, we didn't have money or anybody to give us any. You know? Could you tell me about uh, your family? Were your parents involved into your interest in music somehow? Well, my parents were very busy trying to raise us, you know, because like, um, my daddy go to work very early. But he was the one who was, would sing to us, you know, in the weekend time would take us to the beach. Because he always tell us we shouldn't go to the beach on our own. We should have a big person with us because, you know, you could drown or something like that. Mm -hmm. And not because you can swim, things could happen. So he would bring us that way. And I said some of those old Jamaican folk songs. He would sing to us. And I remember he, he used to love to sing lots of church, church songs. My mom also, she grew up in the church. But it doesn't like they were actually playing any instrument or such where we learned from them. But mm -hmm. we had their voice, they sing, and lots of other people sing, your neighbors sing. So you just catch bits of Jamaican and bits. sing. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the official starting date for Twinkle Brothers is 62. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same time when Jamaica got independence. Yeah. Many Jamaicans are saying it was very 
uh, impressive and it made them really doing music. Was it the same with you? Like yes. You felt on this wave of independence? Yes, because I'm um, like 62, I was 12. And when we heard we were getting independence and you know that you know, separation from other things, we're going to be our own nation and thing, you feel very proud of that. So that creativeness you know, bloom, bloom in all of us because it's okay, we're on our own now, we're independent country, so we can do our own thing, you know. So we start to create our own music. So, even for me, the festival that we went in in 1962 was uh, the Jamaica Pop and Mentor Festival. So, every parish had a festival and you could enter on a parish level. So we entered that year on the parish level and we won for our parish. Mm -hmm. And then we, we the semi-final now we enter against other parishes like <clears throat> St. James, um, St. Elizabeth, Hanover, you know, and um, Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. So we won also from 62, we won right up until 1968. We won the All Island Festival. Mm -hmm. So we won two gold medals. 1968, one as Twinkle Brothers and one Norman Grant, you know, so that festival actually, you know, not just the amateur side of it, but even the the, the professional singers, that some some stories, that they, they were in it, you know, took some meters, he entered about four or five times in the professional side of it, you know, so I think that was great for Jamaica because I myself, you know, we say, well, we could start an industry, you know, but it didn't turn out the way we think because I, I, I think, well, okay, you know, you sing and you're popular in Jamaica. We could say, make the music from Jamaica and it go abroad and you get popular or whatever. But most singers who make record in Jamaica would have to follow where the record go. So you'll end up going abroad. And it's when you go abroad, you know that things are happening. Because mm -hmm. being in Jamaica, you're not going to know what's happening or, you know, in the work you mean. <laughs> yeah, in the work or, you know, how much people like your music, yeah. Yeah. you know. So it was great for me to even start to travel at an early mm -hmm. point in the business mm -hmm. and even start to produce in myself at an early point in the business. Because, as I said, Jamaica artists shouldn't have to go abroad to go and make money. I think we could stay in Jamaica and the money come to us. But it didn't go that way. You have to go travel. Yeah, you have to go and you know seek for it, you know. Mm -hmm. You are a prime example of such traveling artists with your movement to UK. But before we talk about these movements, I would also like to ask you what kind of music did you do in this very beginning it was it was some years before reggae was created. So yeah, did you yeah. do the uh, ska and mental? Yeah, in the early time, because as I say, I started out uh, singing with bands from I was 14, so that is uh, 64. And it was mainly American songs and mm. songs from England that we'll be hearing. And uh, the Calypso, because the tourists come to the Caribbean to listen to Calypso. So in the early part in the business, you would be singing any popular song that play you know, on the radio, because Jamaica up till now, they still love to play foreign music. You don't hear lots of Jamaican music in Jamaica, you know. So we grew up listening to all these songs from abroad, and then you try to imitate these songs, you know. Whether if it's a group, you'd be listening to impressions, you know, the shy lights, you know, um, temptation. Smokey mm. Robinson and mm -hmm. the Miracles, you, mm -hmm. you'll be listening to those groups. Uh, R&B from America, yes. uh, Motown, yeah. Uh, yeah. Soul. Mm. So we'll be singing everything. We'll be singing James Brown, funk, mm -hmm. Calypso at the same time, mm -hmm. and ballads from England, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a good training ground for me, you know, to know all those melodies and different melodies that help you to create your own your own style and also help you not to clash with other music that already made because they have singers now that singing other singers melody and don't even realize that it's somebody it's somebody else's melody because you know they don't know enough 
And you know, with melodies, we grew up from a little kid listening to melodies. You might not even realize that you heard it already. Mm -hmm. But music, as you know, is a certain chords which you're going to repeat yourself over and over. But it's the way you do it and the way you put the notes and things. Mm -hmm. You know, so for myself, I give thanks that I have the ability to mm -hmm. make lots of music and every day I make music. Even we're doing this interview, you know, and we might hit on a subject that we can put to music. That's how I create my stuff. You know? yeah, it's, it's all music. But also, in terms of the message, Ja Rastafari has been a, a, a solid foundation for your music for ages. Uh, how did you hear first about Rasta and Ja and Rastafari? How did you get involved? Where we grew up, as I say, and, and everything, seeing everything, you know, happening. It was just around you. Yeah, it was around us, you know, and like say from, you know, 14 or so, you have Rasta man and um, a chant. So even like 66, when his mother sick came to Jamaica, that time we were, well, I started making music by then, you know, but there's Rasta man was telling us, uh, telling the, the community uh, to live good. Mm -hmm. Stop eat salt, stop eat sugar, you know, them things, you know. So yeah. you, even nowadays when you hear people will say, what the Rasta was telling them from all this time, mm -hmm. what to do, how to take care of your body, you know, and they were listening to the Rasta man from that time, you know. So for me, as I say, I grew up around the churches, you know, and I was very interested about even the scripture, you know, the Bible and all that those story, you know. So even that pull us as close to everything, you know, mm -hmm. but being, I'm 73 now and I still, <clears throat> still searching, you know, and seeking, but you know, you know, and to know is to know, you know, mm -hmm. so we know that, well, for me, as I say, when we talk about Rasta and thing, and I believe, I know in Rasta, not everybody would believe what I believe, but it's good to believe in something. You know, because if you live life and don't have any guidance within your life, you're a waste. You know, you would, as the Majesty they say, you would be like a, a ship without no rudder in a sea where the, the wave would box you around, round and round. So with Rasta or with other people that are talking about love and peace, that's what it's all about in whatever name you might conceive that person to be. You know, but as I said, we learn as Rasta, we learn from the Bible, but even now, reading other Bible or know about other things, even though it's not just the Bible, you know, but the Bible was written many, many times, you know. So for me as a Rasta, anything good, I, I respect, you know. And support. And support, yes. Yeah. I was really surprised to read, but once in Jamaica, you had a band called the Cardinals, from the point of view of the performing priest, <laughs> it was really surprising to me. No, How did well, you get this name? Was it something? No, well, that's the first band that we were in. It was um, the first band that formed in Falmouth. And these musicians, they were like from, you know, upper class, middle class, you know. I've heard lawyers. Yeah, and those kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So my other brother was the only get the youth in the band, you know. And we were playing all over, you know, in the hotels, because around that time, many hotels in uh, Montego Bay, um, Lucy, Negril, Ochi Reyes, you know, we drive all over playing. So we, we were working like uh, six nights a week, go to school daytime and go and work in the, in the nighttime, you know. And that was, again, a good band. Then that band break up and they formed another band, Schubert and the Miracles. Mm -hmm. With some of the say the guys were in the Cardinals, they were in Schubert and the Miracles. And again, we took it to another level. We're in an, another band in Montego Bay, um, um, Lance Telwell and the Celestials. Mm -hmm. I start working with them actually getting paid. You know, I think I'll get them about 20 something pounds a week. You know, which mm -hmm. at the time was still, you know, good, <laughs> this good, good money, money, you know. Yeah. 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 And, um, I was with um, Celestia, Lancel and Celestia for about eight years, mm -hmm. you know, working and even going, entering in the festival at the same time and go to work and, mm -hmm. 
and then we made two albums with that band in the hotels uh, sell to the tourists. And as a matter of fact, just a month ago, I saw one of the album, a guy bought one for 150 pounds. You get it from America. So those records is still available. You know, as you know, vinyl, everybody yeah. now is going back to vinyl. And on that album, I think I did a reggae. I did, I did um, Little Green Apples in reggae and I did it before even um, Dennis Brown made it do a reggae version mm -hmm. I did it but the albums at the time I was singing songs like Up Up and Away Ooh, yeah, no. um, uh, To Sir With Love <laughs> Popcorn you know pure American soul you know mm -hmm. you know but then I uh, said Jamaican bands they were playing all jazz blues you know, we, we grew up playing everything. All the musicians that played on the ska music, yeah. their guys were playing jazz and they learned from other things, you know. So these Jamaican big band from that time, there were like 15 members in the band, like four on section. Yeah, like Scatellites, Mothers. Yes, very uh -huh. big bands. And mm -hmm. those music now is still, still selling. It seems like a, a breaking point in a Twinkle Brothers history, at least in global recognition, was a deal with Virgin in England to release your um, albums. <clears throat> was it really like this? Was it your first serious global exposure? And how do you look at these things from the time perspective? Well, I think that was the best deal I got. I got three deals in England. Actually, I actually approached three company, and Virgin was the third one, oh, yeah. and their deals was the best one. You know, I mean, they put us in a market where we maybe, you know, we couldn't maybe put ourselves. And I remember at that time, the punk music and the punk was born in Revelation, Re 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 yeah. and they love reggae music just like the, the skinhead love the ska music. <clears throat> so. The roots music now we're playing along with the punk music. So Virgin would put out some compilation album and we'd have like um, Sex Pistol, Twinkle Brothers, Gladiators, you know, on one album. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we start to go into a, a crowd, as I said, that maybe we would get to go, you know. So we give thanks for that. But in the business, you know, because I haven't approached another company since Virgin. You know, you know, Twinkle put the whole stuff. When you started your own. Yeah. yeah, you know. So I would say that was the best one at the time, but 30 years after, you realize it still wasn't a good deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know? you could make better things. Yeah, on that's how it goes. But we give thanks, and I'm not gonna, <coughs> I'm not gonna ball, you know. How did you look at these punks in England? I guess you were traveling to England a lot in the second part of. 70s, how did you look at this colorful revolution? Well, you know, I, I started going to England 1975, you know, and um, when I go there, Twinkle Music was already popular there. So for me, that was great because I've been to America after that. And for me, America is too big you know, of a country. And it's not like America is not like reggae, it's popular in every state. You'd maybe have to pass one, two state to go to the state that reggae is popular. And the traveling journey for me is too long, you know. England now, everything is quicker, you know, smaller country. Even even Europe, I love short that. Short and Yeah, you travel shorter, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the experience really for England and with the music, the people knew the music. It's not like you had to come and you know, play to make it. And that's the way in America they, you would have to play to make your name, you know. And that is one thing I don't like about it, where to just drive up and down to play, to get popular, I'm not into that. You know, so it's good when you can go places that people actually know you already, or hear about you or whatever. I prefer that. You know? mm -hmm. When opening new markets yes. and taking all risks. Yeah, <laughs> you know, now that I'm a big man now, mm -hmm. it's even worse now, you know. Mm -hmm. I stay home with my grandchildren now, mm -hmm. you know, or in the studio making music because every day I make music. Mm -hmm. Talking about studio and studio and studio work, that 
has been always a strong part of your music. I'm wondering how do you look at the dub? Uh, do you follow any particular way of doing dub? Do you have some uh, dedicated, special, unique devices? Do you do it analog still? No, well, as you know, with the music and time, everything changed. You know, we start in the business when, you know, it was tape, one track recording, everything after record one time. If one person make mistake, you have to go from the top again. And we start with it, start overdubbing, you know. I remember 66 when we made the first Twinkle Brother record for Duke Reed. That was when the band alone was records, um, laying the track. And you sing, but you mustn't sing too loud, so your voice pick up in the piano or the guitar amplifier. So there's kind of technique that you have to start to use. But I'm a singer that sings very strong, you know. Even now, you know, I'm a strong singer. So I would have to find ways to turn away from the piano so they don't catch your voice. And even them days when we voiced that song, there were no headphones. The, the music play in a box in the corner of the studio and you listen and you sing. But the engineer for somehow they knew how to to blend the thing that you don't hear, the the background noise or whatever. <clears throat> and I think the music was better those days, you know, better made. From the change it from four track, from two track, four track, to sixteen track, to twenty-four tracks. I don't think it make it better for sales or so because mm -hmm. some of the songs weren't even selling more. You were selling less, you know, and even now, the music that the people love, the Jamaican music that people love right now is the early, the early stuff. The ska or 70s and 80s, the, those rhythms, those music are what worldwide now people are craving for. You know, but from the oversight, Jamaica is also famous for current dance hall. No, we we famous for everything. You no, know, tell you because in Jamaica, you could be playing a good groove and you're going playing, and somebody just say, too much of that. No, we want something different. You know, so Jamaica good with giving something different, and we change the music so much time, even half key, out of key singers, out of tune music being hits mm -hmm. you know one time people in jamaica they were just into melodies so a beat could be going boom 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 and you could sing any song over that song and the crowd would say yeah some singer they're not singing on timing but the crowd still love them and they become big stars and they realize they not, can't sing on time they're not doing the right thing now in jamaica we turn it around and gone back to r b so you go to Jamaica now, you don't really hear reggae. You can still play reggae, but not the deep roots reggae. You know, it's, I don't know, they might soon give it another name. I think they also do, you know, because they, they change the name so often, even with the dubs, as you were saying earlier on. You know, the dub music, at the time, uh, what happened with the dub now? You have some audience that love reggae music, but don't love the lyrics of the music. You know, and lots of reggae music, especially cultural roots music. We fire fireborn Babylon, you know, we sing about truth and rights and singing some songs. Some people might think it, it's too personal. So it's too personal for them so they don't listen to the lyrics. So the dub nobody's fireborning them on the dub. Just, whoa, 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 yeah. <laughs> so they could be in the L S D whatever drugs they take and they just go to the dub you know so that again is another part of the music that people will love the reggae so they even know about reggae music by them, start listening some dub and then they maybe want somebody else to tell them but that is just a dub in it you hear the original or hear the vocal then they might seek again for the vocal you know true <laughs> You mentioned that people in Jamaica really follow melodies, but what I observed myself at the places like Rebel Salute is that sometimes some unknown for me singer gets on stage and everybody immediately starts to sing every single word. 
they know the lyrics. It seems like people in Jamaica really take care of the lyrical content yes. of the songs. And I'm wondering if you feel some special personal responsibility for the things you are singing. Well, I want sure, you know, cause at the end of the day, well, if whatever I sing, I try to mean what I sing and try to live what I sing. Because as an artist or as a people, or the word, the word is the power, you know? And if you're saying things that you don't believe or mean, it can hurt you, it can damage you, you know? So if you're singing something, you know, you're, that you're against and you end up, you're into what you're singing about, you know, because really that's what happened to a lot of singer people. They just sing what they think people like or they know people would gravitate to, you know, and not the true, true self of what you really, you know, believe in, you know. So that again, we got to be careful of using words because words have lots of power, you know. So I myself, I, I try not to sing words that I don't mean, you know. And I also try to use lyrics that maybe people talk about, but they don't sing about. All the lyrics of Twinkle Brothers are yours? Oh yes, mm -hmm. you know. But you know, with lyrics, you you listen to people, you you read Catch the face, yeah, you, you read the magazine, you read the news, you whatever. So with words, the written words is is there, you know. So you may be reading a book, reading the Bible, and you see the line and say, yeah, and you put melody to that line or whatever. So within claiming words, the written words is written from thousand years ago. You know, that's how you use words and melodies, you know. What did you know about Poland before you met Clash to Brothers? Well, I remember, well, Poland, what I know about Poland in the 60s, because I born in 1950. So when I was like 10, 12, the cheapest shoes that your parents could buy for you is made in Poland. Really? And it was strong, strong leather shoes or strong shoes, you know, at that Sounds time. Sounds incredible. Yes, <laughs> made in Poland, you know. So <laughs> when I actually come to, you know, get to come here, you know, and see, well, when we start to come, when the money, you know, we come and we got paid in Zalatis, millions of Zalatis. So that is another, you know, experience I had. If I never to count millions again, I've count millions in Poland. You know, you see some money with yeah, lots, of, lots, of zeros, lots of zeros on it, you know? Yeah. So that was another experience because we, we got the money and the musician, they get, you know, like half a million each or whatever to go and spend. And they go into the stores. But what I tell them, I told them was to buy anything. Just buy if you see something you buy. But they were trying to find what they like before they buy. Uh -huh. I was buying like a dozen of that. I buy a trombone, I buy a, <laughs> I buy a trumpet, you know, I buy some leather coats. I think I buy about 15 leather coats. I pay five pounds, it worked out to five pounds for the coat yeah, here in yeah. Poland. I took them to London and I sell them for 85 pounds each. <laughs> I bought some leather skirt for women took them to Jamaica. Serious, I, I, took, I took back three suitcases to London. So I, I invest the money the same way and turn it, you know? Yeah. And I had money, millions in the bank here, was in, in the Polish bank. And we come and then within the changes, and they say, no, they don't want Polish money. You have to have dollars, you know? So that, as I say, it was really a good experience for me, you know. And as I say, even with the poem, when I start my recording studio, I bought my recording studio in 95. And I can remember distinctively, it's like, after we did a tour in Poland, and I go back to London, I, I start buying my equipment, you know. So even that again is another memory for Poland, you know. Mm -hmm. You say, yeah, I, I... So you became a trader, you were uh, yeah, uh, yeah. importing and exporting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and it worked, you know. Um, 
But the first meeting uh, with Poland was in London, yeah? The, the, yes. The, the, the Wodek clash. Yes. Yeah, I located yeah, you in London. Yurik and his, yeah, yeah uh -huh. two brothers were there. Uh -huh. And they came to you and what? Yeah, they find me. I think I said they they looking out for artists who, who, who live in London, you know? Mm -hmm. And for some reason we connected and, you know, we came to the house and we had an interview and we even went to Jashaka. Yeah. to Jashaka shop and had another interview and they were you saying, you were saying, um, what they were saying uh, you don't know how we're going to do it but we should come, you know, and as I said the money was the problem to so, say well, you will get paid but it will be in his lattice, <laughs> you know so I, I did take it, you know, I, I turned it around, you know, and it worked I said, I had a bank account here, you know, and we have millions in the bank account, but then the, the dollar start, it started to devalue, you yeah, know, yeah, so yeah. we just had to find a way to, to spend it. But, you know, for me it was good, and I mean, I've seen the changes from that time till now, and every change is good, but still you can see some change where, you know, you... you well, what I what I realized, you know, the time we came in the well, it was communist time, I guess, yeah, uh, yeah. eight eighty eight. You're traveling on the on the bus or the public transport or whatever. The old people, they were to me because I, I live in England, and the old people the same age is like the one in England. They in Poland, they're strong. They look strong and fit and. You don't hear them coughing like in England, you go on the public transport. <laughs> people like they have very bad, you know, chest cold or whatever. These people were like, you know, proud, you know, in their fur coats, you know, like, because I even buy a, a fur coat here, you know. <laughs> they're in their fur coat you know, and they sit in the, you know, really proud and thing, you know. And even the, 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 the kids now, they were fire burning the soldiers. Now we come from, we come on the plane, you see the soldiers and the tarmac, big guns and thing. but the, 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 the youth them in the street, they're like, uh, uh, they're cheering them, you know? And another experience, you know, you go to the churches or any... Hold on. But Norman, because you are overloading, no. you speak louder okay, now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I have a problem in the headphones, I think. You look too loud. Yeah. Okay, it would be better. Uh huh. Yes, I could remember even going into the churches and anywhere flowers were planted. This is I wanted to ask you about it because I remember once you told me you've seen some ganja plants in yes, the church. Yes, in, in the churchyard in the, among the flowers, you know. Wow. The kids uh, they planted all. I remember we did an album here in the Spirit Studio. And we recording the studio and outside the ganja, they would just go and get ganja and put it on the the eater to dry out a bit. Yeah, so we're getting herb, you know? So that was again another experience. We say, yeah, you're smoking herb and nobody know what you're smoking. Nobody, you know. Yeah, curse. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But with the change now, I heard the farmers, the guys that started to steal the farmers ganja, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And the change what I've seen like in Warsaw, in the communist time, I never see any beggars or so on the street or nothing like that or, you know, but with the change, as you know, change bring everything. And when the change happened, I see lots of beggars, you know, they're everywhere. Well, I guess uh, capitalism, you know, when it comes to capitalism, all these things you're gonna see, you know, begging, yeah. prostituting, the same Drugs. thing all around, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that you know, the same so, rules. So the people they they vote for for that and they get it, you know. Because I said we came and even did shows for um, solidarity, mm -hmm. and you know, help within the change. You yeah. know, you put the solidarity logo on the yeah. That was on the, the um, underground underground LP, and that LP came out eighty four, I think eighty four, eighty four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were. Thinking, thinking about, about what was happening because it was on the news, you know. Yeah, the martial law were on, on, on the news and thing, you know. So these are the things I do, you know. I, I yes, I, I yeah. make songs 
about world affairs, world happening, you know. Yeah, so you can see the side of the Today, yeah. yeah. It's here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, how uh, how it happened that you were uh, asked uh, for collaboration with Trebunia Tutki? Obviously, it's a very important project for global world music. And I know it was idea of Wodek. Yes, yeah, Wodek is the one that... Um, yeah, what was your first thoughts? Did you like this music or you had to convince yourself a little bit? Well, what, when we actually, you know, it's not, well, he told us that there's a group from the mountain and they're conscious with their lyrics and they're, you know, really spiritual and, you know, same way like how we from Jamaica, Twinkle Brothers, we do roots music. He said, oh, yeah, this group, they're into that and he said he'd see where if we collaborate something could happen you know I don't even remember if I did hear any kind of music but when we came and heard what was happening myself now as a drummer with Dub Judah I was just Dub Judah and myself that came and we hear the thing as you know said to Judah now what we have to do we listen to them but we're not gonna follow them we have to create our beat, keep the beat. So they, you know, because it was like, you know, I have to no, after going ahead and say, no. The rhythm must be there. Yeah, yeah we have to keep a, a beat, you know. So don't, you know, listen too much to that and carry away. We have to hold ourselves. And because it was just two of us, you know, to do the bass and the drum first and then overdub. So that's the good thing about overdubbing, at least you can start from two instruments and overdub, overdub. What was the biggest surprise after you arrived to this uh, remote Polish village in the mountains? Well, I, w I tell you, I wasn't surprised. It was, well, to me, it was like a tourist area, you know, because um, you see the uh, lots of, well, they look like Polish people too, but they come from maybe the cities and come there. So when they take us even to a certain place and everybody dressed in the, the same outfit and thing, you know, it's okay. It's a, like a village, village vibe. So it's okay. That was good about it. And we took pictures. I took picture with, you know, the hat and, the, and we sing about it, you know. So yeah, it's a good, good experience, good vibes. And it was always snowy time when we come, because when we make the records, it was always snow. We went up in the mountain. You went to as far as your knee in, in snow. Yeah. It must be different uh, uh, perspective than Blue Mountains. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, but, you know, we did everything. You know, it, it was still a good vibes. I remember when we were making a film, a video, and we're on the mountain and I, I cry out, Jah, Rastafari! And the, the place was get. we have to leave the mountain, you know, because the snow, more snow start coming, yeah. And, you know, one, one good experience I have is like, although you, you're cold, but you could get some hot, hot beer, they give you a hot beer to drink, you know, a hot spirit, yeah, you know. Yeah, warm up. <laughs> you warm up and stuff, you know. Yeah, right. So we still love the Polish vibes and hopefully our next project, you know, the way I see it, it could happen from Jamaica, you know, because we, I come here twice now to make, you know, two albums or so with the Tribune of Tutki. So I, I, I will speak, you know, I'm saying it now publicly, I will speak to um, Christoph about the next venture when it come about, you know, we could plan something for Jamaica. You mean, come you mean to Jamaica. this dream to bring Trebunias to Jamaica yeah, and to make, record the album? Yeah, yeah, do, in do the, 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 yeah or the next project in Jamaica. Yeah. You know, it's just a planning, you know, and it can happen. Mm -hmm. you know? And you have your own studio in Jamaica and oh, yes. you are going to open your club? Oh yes, I, I'm going to open a, like a youth club. You know, I want to do something for the, the youths, you know, because so when I was growing up, we had those facilities. You could go to youth club as a, a kid and create your own little thing. The stage shows, you go and 
show your talent and people hear you. So if you have some talent from an early age, that always good and it helps, you know. So the young, the young ones, you know, they are the ones I would like to, you know, do something for, you know. See. Mm -hmm. And a special message for the Polish listeners and a final word. Well, you just give thanks that they're listening and keep listening. And, you know, we know the right thing and the people who know the right thing should do the right thing. And less talk and more action, you know, from everyone, not just a politician, but individual too, you know. Thank you, Norman, for the interview. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks.